recording. And then I would like to introduce our presenter today, um, Mirette. She is um, the a, a doctor, a neonatologist at uh, VCU uh, Children's Hospital of Virginia. She's also an assistant professor in the Division of Neonatology. And without further ado, I would like to turn it over to her for the presentation today. All right, thank you, Shannon. I'm gonna go ahead and um, start screen sharing my screen. Uh, let me know if you all could see this. Hold on one second. Yes, it. All right. Yep. I'm gonna and then. Um, what was that? Give me one second. Perfect. Okay. All right. So. Hello everyone, I'm Mehreti Tayo. I'm one of the neonatologists at Children's Hospital of Richmond at VCU. Um, I'm honored to be here to um, talk to you all today about limits of viability. Most of my talk will focus on reviewing what we know um, and what data is out there um, about um, um, viability at different gestational age and um, outcomes um, for, those, for those infants. All right, I have no disclosure. I wanna start by this question to you all, and this is just um, a hypothetical question to all of you as we talk um, through the next few slides. So if you have a patient facing a 95% definite mortality, and there is an aggressive treatment available with 5% chance of intact survival, would you offer that treatment to your patient? And again, this question is made up. And uh, the patient necessarily does not have to be a newborn. It can be an adult, any patient as, as um, providers as you all. Uh, if you are faced with this question and scenario, what would you do? No answers needed. Just think about this as we go through the um, next slides. So the objective here, as I said today, is to describe current international and national trends in short and long-term outcomes of uh, at limits of viability. Uh, we'll try and describe some factors that improve outcomes at limits of viability and discuss interdisciplinary strategies that have been um, put out or recommended um, that would improve the care of extremely premature infants. Um, we'll go over some terms and definitions, again, some national, international data, outcome variations, prediction tools that are available and their limitations, and again, some recommendations. So there are several terms put out there that describe um, babies that are born at um, early gestational age. Um, limits of viability, margin of viability, pre-viable, extreme prematurity, extremely extreme prematurity, borderline of viability, um, you know, threshold of viability, so many terms to describe um, the same group of populations. Um, a threshold of viability is anyone born as it's in literature before 25 weeks gestation or less than 750 gram. Marginal viability has been uh, coined to describe babies at 23 to 30, 26 um, gestational age. But despite several terms used, they do not really fully reflect all the relevant issues that um, this babies um, face. So, Standard definition of a pre peri viability is a stage of fetal maturity with a marginal chance of extra uterine survival. And this has been defined by different national and international um, professional societies as um, gestational age between 20 and 25 week uh, completed week gestation. Viability really is a function of the biomedical and the technological capacity of, of um, uh, the care given to these babies. And as you all know, this, this capacities differ in institution to institution, um, you know, nation to nation and, and across very mar many variables. So really that is the function that makes um, an infant obviously physiologic and um, um, physiologic maturity of the babies is a big part of this, but the definition that once put in as to what, what gestation should be considered viable or able to uh, have a chance in extra uterine um, survival, it varies. 
So because of this, there's really no one consensus or worldwide uniform gestational age cutoff for viability um, in, in practice. So the gestation or, uh, age vi for viability have been shifting, um, as you all probably is already aware, over several years. Um, so here is a curve that shows different uh, studies done from the 1970s to early 2000s, showing the gestational age uh, and their survival um, at different gestational age. As you go from um, left to right, uh, you see increase in gestational age and the percentage of survival describes there uh, on the vertical axis. So before, the, if you see the light blue, the purple, the dark purple, and the green to your right, um, those are um, patients or uh, studies done early 90s and um, 70s and some in the 60s. As you can see, there is virtually death was um, guaranteed below 25 weeks um, of gestation. Um, as time passes and um, advent of surfactant and um, antenatal steroids, gestational age is much at much lower, uh, gestational ages babies started to survive. Uh, as you can see, um, studies from Japan, which is represented in blue, deep blue to the left and red um, shows that there are babies who survived a 22 week gestation. Mm -hmm. So continuing with the definitions between um, AAP and um, American Heart Association, the International Liaison for Resuscitation in 2000, recommended an initiation of resuscitation uh, for confirmed gestational aid less than 23 weeks at birth or weight or weight less than 400 gram and a confirmed gestation between 20, 23 and 24 with infants, uh, depending on infant's condition or parental choice or both. In 2014, a Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine and NICHD, as well as um, ACOG and AAP put together a de the definition of periviable birth that we use currently, which is delivery that occurs between 20 and 25 weeks um, completed. Um, and this definition was selected as it encompasses the survival range from zero to 50% um, respectively. All right. In 2015, the AP and HA uh, concluded that there's no new evidence to change this recommendation, uh, the recommendation that was put in 2000, and um, no definition changes were made. In 2020, um, non-initiation in extremely preterm births and certain severe congenital anomalies. Now, this has expanded from the previous um, recommendation for non-initiation. This time, international guidelines describe, again, pre-viability 22 to 24, um, and then individual parent informed decision based on social, maternal, fetal, and neonatal factors um, should be made um, when to initiate resuscitation or not was the advice. And this is in accordance with an increasing survival at the periviable um, period of newborns. So why does all this matter? You know, this population consists of 0.1 to 0.4 of all life births. Um, it, it represents a variety of complex medical, social, and ethical decisions. Involve this, um, it involves this to uh, resuscitate babies. And again, this babies um, with survival comes grave uh, circumstances that carries high risk of, of morbidity and mortality and lifelong complications. Um, so the impact of these infants and in their families in the healthcare system and society is profound. Uh, and hence the, the balance between um, recommendations to, um, to carefully evaluate the evidence out there in terms of resuscitating babies and outcomes uh, of doing so. So I'll start off with some international data. Some are dated as there was no data since then from those countries and some are more recent. The Epicure study from United Kingdom. This is a study short term that evaluated short term outcomes after extreme preterm births in England. They looked at two birth cohorts in 1995 and 2006. Um, babies included were 22 to 25 week. Uh, 182 hospitals participated in this. Um, with this, the three um, elements that I put up here are a provision of antenatal steroids, 68% in 1995 for this periviable population, 
82% in 2006. That uh, corresponds to survival to discharge at 40% in 1995 cohort and 53% in 2006 cohort. And um, the other, you know, rather impressive um, finding of this study was survival without major morbidity at discharge was uniform in both um, in both cohorts, uh, despite an increase in survival of the periviable um, infants, including 22, 23, and 35. 25. And um, this led to the um, understanding that the survival of more early born babies was not necessarily a trade off uh, for major morbidities um, at discharge. And you'll see how um, other nations' data agree with this finding. Uh, so, this is the major morbidities that uh, looked at in this Epicure UK study. Um, severe retinopathy of prematurity that's needed treatment, um, BPD as defined by oxygen dependent at 36 weeks, and severe abnormalities on cerebral ultrasonography defined by grade 3 and 4 IVH. Um, as you can see, very close um, percentage among survivors of these morbidities um, at discharge. So recently, Epicure 2, which is a continuation of that study, was done to look at the survival of these pre periviable babies at um, two years of age to look for um, relatively long-term neurodevelopmental outcome. Um, and you can see the two different cohorts and the four different gestational ages at the bottom. The very dark um, green is those who died. Um, the next shade of green after that is severe disability with white being no disability. Um, as you can see, the, the percentage of babies that died in this gestation um, went decreased in each of this gestational age. But despite that, the, um, the amount of babies who have severe disabilities and other disabilities remain relatively similar. Again, proving um, survival not being necessarily a trade-off for um, long-term disability in this case. A study from Sudan, Express a study, extremely um, preterm Sudan study is what this is. So they looked at um, two times, the study was done at Swedish cohort in 1990 to 1992. This looked at babies less than 1,000 gram, 931 of them. Um, there was no active care during that cohort um, uh, study. Um, active care, we will define later, but that means active resuscitation of babies at the periviable period. Um, there was only 20% antenatal steroid um, supplementation or provision, and one-year survival for that uh, cohort was 6% at 22-week, 28% at 23-week. Um, looked at the data in 2009 again to include cohorts from 2004-2007. This time was 40% antenatal steroid provision and about 6% C-section. Uh, and entocolysis um, done for about 62% of this patient showed 10% survival. So a relative increase, um, but definitely does not reflect, you know, the current practice and um, the current outcome in even in Sudan. The one year without major neonatal morbidity, survival without major mor uh, neonatal morbidity was 20% at 22 week and 17% at 23 week. Um, again, very close major neonatal um, morbidity um, um, in this two gestational age, even though the care provided is different. Um, so this improvement from this express study in outcome was attributed to proactive perinatal management in the later cohort. The EPI page two study, this is from France. This is a national prospective population-based cohort, um, included all maternity and neonatal uh, units in France, compared 1997 and 2011 um, cohorts. And here in orange is the 2011 cohort, and um, in 1997 mm -hmm. one was in, is in blue. Mm -hmm. The first graph, survival to discharge, so percentage to discharge of uh, the different gestational age, you can see here at 20 to 23 weeks, um, there was no survival. At 24 weeks, there was no difference between the two um, year cohorts. And as the gestational age increases, the survival increased in both cohorts, but more so in the 2011 um, cohort. Um, survival to discharge without morbidity, um, that gap is very visible. 
here in the 1997 blue and in the 2011 orange cohort uh, starting 24 week gestation. Um, again, there was no survival 2023, so there was no survival without morbidity number on here. So then looked at their antenatal steroid provision and for the same two cohorts, um, more provision in the later cohort in 2011, which is attributed again to better outcome um, in terms of morbidities in this population as well as survival. So this is consistent with what the guidelines were in France um, at the time. Um, these were the provisions um, at the time, 25 week resuscitation and full intensive care unless unfavorable factors. And those included congenital anomalies, you know, known uh, prognosis, chromosomal anomalies. Uh, at 24 week, in the absence of unfavorable associated factor, parents wish should be honored was the guideline. Uh, in the less than 24 week, the palliative, palliative care was the only option offered to families. Hence, um, the graph that shows um, zero survival below 24 week. We look at Japan in 2015. This looked at babies born 22 to 23 weeks gestation uh, from the Japan Neonatal Research Network. Um, this is over 2003 to 2005, over 1,000 babies, 22 to 25 weeks. Um, the number of 22 weekers in this cohort was 75, and over 223 weekers were included. Um, mortality and um, neurodevelopmental impairment was assessed at 36 to 42 months. And survival at 22 weeks, this is 2015, was 36%. And for that of 23 weekers was 62%. 12% um, of 22 weekers at the time um, survived um, unimpaired or intact, whereas 20% 20 of 23 week had the same uh, similar outcome. This is a most recent data just published this year, 2023, from um, the, the a single center study from Japan. Again, going over management of outcome of periviable newborns born at 22 week gestation only. Um, luckily, these events are rare, so there are only 29 patients over a seven-year period. A seven -year period. Um, looked at retrospectively, survival rate was 82.8%, with no need for tracheostomy or VP shunt need, and 13% severe uh, or grade 3 and 4 IVH, 38% moderate to severe neurodevelopmental impairment, and 61% survival with no or mild neurodevelopmental impairment. Um, I want to pause here and, and, and say the definitions of neurodevelopmental impairment are variable um, uh, from nation to nation, pr primarily. Um, most of the definitions include um, cerebral palsy as a profound or severe neurodevelopmental impairment. And in most of the, the studies that I have looked at, what's considered no or mild neurodevelopmental impairment is um, primarily sensory issues or uh, cognitive scores, daily scores that are below 85, but not less than you know 70, which would be considered severe or language delays that uh, were later um, assessed. We move on to German. This is 2016, looked at 20 to 23 weekers um, following active prenatal and postnatal care, keyword being active, which means full resuscitation with intensive care admission. They looked at 106 patients from 2010 to 2014, uh, 45 of those were 22 weekers. Active care was provided at 62% of those 22 weekers and about 95% for the 23 weekers. Survival to discharge was 60% in the 22 weekers. This is again, German 2016. And a survival without severe morbidity was 22% for this uh, cohort. Um, key features that led to this outcome described in the study were use of uh, prenatal steroids after parental counseling from 22 weeks of gestation onwards. Um, surprisingly, cesarean delivery with local anesthesia as mode of delivery for this um, cohort of gestational age. Um, delayed cord clamping, comfort positioning, which at their, um, at their um, guideline was considered lateral placement of the infant. Uh, establishment of spontaneous breeze via a stepwise increase in PEEP 
and less invasive surfactant application. So these were the major components of their uh, medical guideline from the center that were attributed to improved outcome in 2016. Moving on to Australia, um, this is data from 20, 2005 to 2010. They looked at all babies less than 500 grams uh, and or 22 week or more. So not necessarily just 22 weekers. 36 babies were included in this study and 69% received active care, um, full resuscitation you know, in the, in the delivery room with an overall survival of 39%. And if looking at uh, the denominator to be those who made it to the NICU after NICU admission, that makes it 54%. Because again, it was not 100% active care provision. So if one does not intubate or provide active care, it's hard to put that as the denominator to define survival, if that makes sense. Um, survival without any neurodevelopmental impairment was 6% from this cohort for, uh, for um, this 36 babies. And with severe disability that they assessed at one year uh, was 58%. So I'll move on to some national numbers here in the United States. Um, data from NICDH Neonatal Research Network is primarily where most of the data comes from. Um, this is an earlier one from 1993 to 2005. Um, here is the gestational age of babies across horizontal uh, line and vertically you see person survival to hospital discharge among live births, which is again, very important distinction um, because the denominator is all babies that were born live, um, not necessarily those that are born and received care at delivery. Uh, with that in mind, from 1993 again to 2015, the darker the number, the the most updates the data or the year. Um, so really the survival of 22 weekers plateaued around six to nine percent um, over um, this several years, 1993 to 2015. Um, the rest of gestational age steadily increased in survival as time goes on and the more survival for um, older gestational age as depicted here. And then another um, study again from the, N the NRN from 2003, 2007. Um, this is a highlight of that study where there, it included 421, 22 weekers, 871, 23 weekers. And um, some of the factors that are um, reported in the international studies to have better outcome or are major components of an active care are listed here. Um, antenatal steroid provision was only 13% for 22 weekers, whereas 85% for 24 weekers. Um, C section was provided for seven patients of the 421 22 weekers. There is no distinction whether this was done for maternal indication or in, um, infant indication. Um, delivery room intubation was only 19. Um, so around 370 something patients did not get intubated of the 22 gestational week gestational age. Um, those that died less than 12 hours were 85% where 38% have severe intracranial bleed. And as we discussed before, survival was around 6% in that cohort as well. As the gestational age increases, as you can see, provision of steroids increases, C-section delivery increases, so does um, survival. So rates of survival with morbidity decreased from 100% at 22 week to 92% at 23 week and, and, and so forth. Again, as the gestation increases, survival um, um, increases as well um, and a state, steady improvement for each additional week of gestation as we've seen in the graph. This is gestational age specific survival. Um, that they looked at, again, included most of those international studies as well, the APH and the EPIQ from UK, France, and, and Switzerland and Australia. Um, the uh, NICDH or NRN data is the small blue one here, which is again around 10%, with this being Japan um, with the last blue um, bar, bar graph there. And then the orange representing the Canadian um, neonatal network data 
as well as pediatrics or you know Medinax data, um, the Lytha or the one. So this again is uh, most recent data that came out from the NRN looking at mortality and more in hospital morbidity and two year outcome in extremely preterm infants 2013 to 2018. This one came out, I believe 2022 or this year. Um, among extremely preterm infants born um, in these years, um, data was collected from 19 United States academic medical centers um, 78% um, survived to discharge, a significant higher rate than for infants born um, compared to the previous cohort of 2012. Um, 550 22 weekers were included. If you look at the data only for 22 weekers, then um, survival overall is still 10%. Um, when you look at um, centers who provided active care at the delivery for 22 weekers, that survival um, rate goes to 30% um, nationally. So this is really by far the best national data that we have, um, survival from live births versus survival with active treatment um, would be 30%. And then there's Iowa 2020 um, outcome for 18 to 22 months corrected age for infants born at 22 to 25 weeks. Um, this, um, Data shows 70 babies between 22 and 23 weeks gestation, and then uh, 24 to 25, 178 babies with a survival number of 78% to discharge among the most premature ones, and survival with no to mild neurodevelopmental inform, uh, impairment um, result uh, with 64% of those. Um, again, the Iowa uses the national neurodevelopmental informed definition from the NRN that I have um, tried to describe before. Um, what's attributed to this success during the study period? Um, this is um, what was reported in this paper. Do not We do not limit resuscitation based on size or weight at birth. All parents of fetuses at 20 to 23 gestation were offered active resuscitation. Uh, antenatal steroid provision was 91%, which is critical. And consensus among neonatologists, obstetricians, um, and obstetricians that active management um, may achieve better survival without neurodevelopmental impairment for these patients. Um, the work that was done over these years in Iowa is obviously very extensive, which I will not um, go over here, um, but with uh, nonetheless with, with such an outcome. Um, again, comparing Iowa's data in yellow to von type CNEQs in 2018, which is in grade, uh, as well as few selected um, international countries like Norway, Japan, and Sweden. This shows survival from live born 22 to 24 weekers. Um, you can see um, the difference from the national data, which is really the light. Um, the, the sky blue color in the right in the middle from the NRN, um, which is equivalent to the VON data, and the yellow one from the single center at Iowa Steadfast um, Children's Hospital. Um, antenatal story provision, this is what um, centers at um, that are considered equivalent to Iowa Children's Hospital in terms of their NICU level. Um, provided to Vaughn in terms of antenatal steroid provision for 20 to 23 weekers and the practice at Iowa um, for the same um, variable of antenatal steroids. Um, again, significant difference in terms of, um, at least difference in terms of uh, how many um, mothers receive this before delivery. So all these variations internationally, nationally, institution to institution are, you know, primarily focused in, 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 in three main um, categories, so to, so to speak. One is the care. Are you giving active, comprehensive, uniform, proactive? You know, these are all terms used um, for provision of care at delivery versus are we doing selective or, or no care at delivery based on you know whatever criteria is set institutionally or locally? Um, this is probably the best paper I could get that shows this one element being um, the major factor in terms of outcome variations across institutions. This compares 
22 weekers um, that received comprehensive care versus selective care. Um, the comprehensive care is at Uppsala Sudan and nationwide uh, at Ohio was given um, selective approach to infants born at 22 weeks. Um, with this, um, proactive care, again, 100% in Uppsala Sudan, uh, about 22% um, were given active care or proactive care at nationwide was 25% given inconsistent care. Um, that was defined as present at delivery, but decision made based on provider and factors that were present to proceed with resuscitation or not. Um, antenatal steroid provision, 85% in Sudan, 25 here in nationwide, no C-sections for this population at, at um, um, Sweden, 31%, um, mostly described for maternal indications. Uh, survival of discharge 53% versus 8%, and one year survival 53% versus 19%. Uh, unimpaired uh, at 18 months was 43%, where there was none from the Ohio cohort. Um, again, another um, another really indicational proof that um, the way the care is provided or taught out before the baby is born in terms of active comprehensive care, including um, antenatal steroid provision and collaborative with obstetric versus um, selective um, approach and the difference in outcome. The other factors is the provider. So this is just a, a study, you know, um, that shows that at an online survey of 162 consultative neonatologist registrants and and, and um, providers that was done to ask them at what gestational age would you provide resuscitation? And at what gestational age are you willing to withhold resuscitation um, respectively in these two graphs? Um, obviously this decision for the providers is informed by what was going on at the time and what the national guidelines and directives were, uh, but it's also a reflection of um, personal beliefs, moral and ethical um, understanding of, 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 um, of the situation. Uh, so on, on, the, on the first graph, you see they're in red, um, really to point out is a Netherlands before 23 week, even at 23 week, only 10 to 15% were willing to provide resuscitation and not before that. Whereas in comparison in Sudan, um, almost 70%, over 70% were willing to provide resuscitation at 22 week. Um, and in terms of withholding resuscitation, um, in Netherlands, almost 100% were willing to withhold resuscitation for a little over 25 week. Um, whereas in um, Sudan, um, at 20 at 23 um, week or at 22 weeks only 80 percent were um, willing to hold resuscitation um, based on gestational age alone again it's informed by what's going on um, at those nations um, those those answers of the providers but in 2009 standard in UK was not to resuscitate at 23 and zero in the Dutch and the Netherlands in 2010, um, the advice was active care at 24 week only and not below that. And in Sudan, um, the advice was to transfer to level three centers and consider antenatal steroid resuscitation at 22 and zero. And hence the significant variation in, turn in responses from the providers. So there are other several factors I'll just mention two. Um, that affect these variations in outcome and 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 um, long term short and short term outcome. This is again a twenty twenty um, two article from uh, on JAMA based on uh, looking at variabilities in um, offering active treatment based on maternal race and ethnicity. Um, they concluded that overall the active treatment of peri viable births significantly increased um, um, nationally. This is again in the United States only. Uh, however, observed racial and ethnic differences in receipt of active treatment um, as measured by disparity ratio persisted for neonates in Asian Pacific Islanders, um, African Americans and Hispanics compared to whites. Um, lots of factors in play here. Um, survival of infants born at pre-variable gestation. This one looked at really uh, an independent um, 
uh, contribution of birth weight at at the de at delivery as part of um, survival chance. And um, the conclusion was there is an increase in survival over years. Again, the same conclusion for infants born not periviable gestational age and birth weight over 500 gram is associated with a fourfold higher survival compared to less than or equal to 500 gram in this um, population of periviable infants. So other lists are again, definition, what do we call 22 weaker as a 2020 or 2026? Um, so completed week versus weeks plus or minus days. Definition of survival, is this after live birth or after NICU admission? Um, and definition of, again, as I mentioned before, um, impairment and high attrition rate to follow these babies as well um, does not give the whole picture of, you know, long-term neurodevelopmental outcomes. And then obstetric approach to care, is that active monitoring mode of delivery? Would you provide tocolysis to transfer mothers? Mm -hmm. um, would you provide antenatal steroids in a timely fashion, antibiotics and treatment? Um, um, that are needed for prolonged rupture of membrane and the like. And then NICU approach to care, active versus conservative. Are we transporting uh, outborn patients or are we um, transporting mothers before delivery? Is there a separate team that cares for this um, for these babies? What is the culture in the unit and the um, you know the perceive the the perception of survival in this patient all already documented to contribute to to outcome in this population. Um, and then cohort selection as the different studies report right we have seen twenty two to twenty five twenty two only all that mixes data and um, makes interpretation difficult. Uh, are we using birth weight or gestational age to, you know, combine data and to have a better understanding? When were you born? You know, then as we all know, neonatology has has um, come a long way. So those cohorts from early on versus now um, also affect um, how we look at um, this data. And most importantly, experience. Um, I don't think there's a better data that shows um, this, the importance of experience and having um, a dedicated team than, than the numbers we've seen from Iowa. Um, so the limitations of the prediction tools that we have in terms of counseling parents, this is the NICHD um, um, prediction tool for survival. The first one was uh, from um, early on, then was modified in 2006, 2012, using 5,000 babies at 20 to 25 week. This is the minimum gestation you can put and the minimum weight you can put in this uh, predictive tool. Uh, with a female born singleton and received antenatal steroids, um, here is the outcome that it provides currently, a 27% average survival. Um, and if with active treatment and if not actively treated, 10%, uh, which is surprising. Um, but with um, in terms of outcomes at 18 to 26 months, um, you can see the numbers listed here, uh, profound um, neurodevelopmental impairment that includes TB being around 10% um, in this population. Um, these are numbers when only the gender is changed um, and, and becomes a boy. So what are the limitations of this tool? Again, what is the data sort? Which cohort uh, of babies are we selecting? Gestational age is only an estimate by the time we use this tool to counsel parents. Uh, estimated fatal weight is does not necessarily mean the birth weight of the baby. As we all know, there is obviously a correlation, but that could skew what numbers you would get um, in this from this tool. Race and ethnicity are not included, and we've seen an example of that um, being a factor in terms of um, receiving active care or not. Um, where are you being born in a level four center, level three center? What's the mode of delivery? How long were we having rupture of membrane? Um, the physician or the provider's philosophy, and then the regional policies where this tool is applied um, based on any state mandates of resuscitation or not. So all these things limit the usability of currently existing predictive tools to counsel parents. So where do we go from all this data nationally, internationally? Um, um, and ECOG and AP met in 2017, 
And this was the consensus based on gestational age of periviable births. So grabbing your attention to the 24 and 25 weekers, everything is recommended. Resuscitate the baby, give a steroid, provide the cholesterol if necessary, magnesium antibiotic for PPROM, uh, and C-section if indicated. Going to the 23 weekers, um, everything is um, advised to be considered, including uh, steroids and, uh, and C-section um, for fetal indication as well. When you move on to 22 weekers, neonatal assessment um, for resuscitation has moved from not recommended to consider from um, the last time the committee and AP met in 2014. Uh, however, none of the um, factors that we have already discussed would improve outcome are not recommended. Um, and lack of data on this specific population is what's cited for this conclusion of not recommendation. Um, which again is an important point because we have seen data after data, so nation from nation, how this thing is, would definitely affect survival as well as outcome. Not all of them, but at least the antenatal steroids and um, early recognition and treatment um, with antibiotics and, and magnesium. So what do we know? Medical decision-making for marginally viable premature infant will always be difficult. Um, the survival rate has improved over the last uh, few decades and it will likely continue to improve. The current state of knowledge permits only crude assessment of prognosis because of the limitations of our tools that we have discussed. So it is, it is not complete to recommend fully resetting everyone without a limit. Um, so what is recommended um, by all the different institutions and the national um, data that are out there. Um, recognizing the changing pattern of survival over time, accept the limits of viability will continue to decline and be aware of current national and local outcomes. And a team approach to perinatal management is vital um, uh, if we were to practice resuscitating um, newborns at periviable gestation. Um, coordinated and consistent counseling to parents with incorporating up-to-date and accurate information as able. And this includes your institution data, local data, or, or national data. Um, and keeping the patient's best interest as a primary objective and focusing on joint decision-making uh, with the parents um, uh, pre-delivery and collaborating and standardizing guidelines and approach both before the baby is born at birth and in the newborn ICU setting. Um, and again, starting at the beginning, if the plan is or the joint decision that was made was to try and resuscitate the baby, including the antenatal steroids and um, delivering at the appropriate center. Um, so at VCU, uh, this would be just one slide of what we have started to do. It needs its own talk with the work um, that we are trying to do in caring for periviable um, patients and improving our outcome. Um, multidisciplinary collaborative team, this includes the NICU providers, obstetricians, um, particularly um, maternal fetal medicine, physicians, nursing, cardiology, radiology, uh, pharmacist, um, a lot of team members, um, collaborate in um, working to improve care at periviable care, so gestation. So two years of information education, interinstitutional ex experience exchange. We have done um, a virtual workshop with um, Iowa Children's, uh, the Children's Hospital at Iowa, and also visited in person to again um, exchange their experience in caring for this population. Um, and gathering what we need as we move forward with caring for um, these babies and um, review of baseline practice and identification, identification of areas of for improvement. Um, again, we have always taken care of 22, 20, 23, 24 weekers. Um, our 22 week um, care was just like nationwide as um, wait and see or um, at delivery, making selective uh, decisions based on the provider in the current circumstances. Um, so looked at past data based on this uh, philosophy of what we have done and what we can improve from there. Uh, a system-based clinical and nursing guideline is developed and um, 
this is informed by best practice available again taking all those reports from centers who have done well in caring for these babies and a dedicated team performing ongoing live assistance um to guide adherence to these guidelines um, on clinical rounds and ongoing review to identify further areas of improvement. These are really the highlights of what um, we have done so far in caring for these babies at Chore. And I am willing to share um, all of this in, in a document format that we have for anyone interested. And we are now working with the VNPC um, to try and establish a peri-viable birth registry. Um, to our knowledge, this would be the first. It's, uh, we plan it to be a state-based um, and based on other registries or healthcare registries that are done, this is an important part of caring for this population to share experience and, um, and improve care and learn from each other as well as um, evaluate outcomes um, to identify areas of improvement in the future. More detail on the Perivival Birth Registry um, October 23rd at the VNPC. And this is my contact information. And thank you. Thank you very much. So lots of information, um, lots of great information. So we are gonna, we have about nine minutes left. I wanna open it up for any questions that anybody may have. Um, the chat is open, so you can go ahead and use the chat and we will answer any questions. And while we are waiting to see if anybody has any questions, um, one more shameless plug is we do have our seventh annual VNPC Summit that is this coming weekend. It is a two-day, which is the first time we have done a two-day summit. Um, it will be from 8.30 to 1 on Sunday, reception at 5.30 on Sunday, and then Monday we will have our 8 to 4 o'clock, um, 8.30 to 4 o'clock on Monday. Everything is on the website if you're wanting to register. And I am not seeing any questions, which means I think that you covered this topic very, very well and in depth. I think that you provided a lot of literature. Um, and yes, lots of thank you very much and lots of great information. So um, Without further ado, I will give you guys back seven minutes in your day and have a good afternoon. Wonderful. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you. Bye. Everyone. Thank you, everybody.